sure you can sympathize when I say that I spend just way too much of my energy wishing people would say what they mean. Like my students at UGA who, when I ask, are you a feminist, or when I eavesdrop on them asking each other, they say, no, I'm not a feminist, but, and then they say something that's pretty feminist. <laughs> and while it's tempting to blame this confounding contradiction on millennials, I'm not a feminist, but actually has widespread appeal. Clearly driving me crazy has absolutely no age requirement. It's like comedian Aziz Ansari says, if you believe that men and women have equal rights and then someone asks you if you're a feminist, then you have to say yes because that's how words work. <laughs> oh, now I feel bad that you laughed because as a rhetorical critic, that's actually not how words work. It's also not how I believe that people work. As Ansari is enforcing a binary. Either you're a feminist, in which case you do believe in gender equality, or you don't really believe in gender equality, and therefore you're not a feminist. But you can't have it both ways. And Ansari's binary seems natural because we're trained from birth to separate our world into mutually exclusive categories. Man, woman, black, white, with us or with the terrorists. But binaries, I know, it's funny unless you're with the terrorists. <laughs> but binaries aren't natural, they're rhetorical, which means they're deeply ingrained habits of language that help us move more easily through our messy world. That's a useful way to think of rhetoric if you, like my dad, think that I spent nine years getting a PhD and being a better bullshitter. <laughs> binaries are rhetorical because they force choice amidst contradiction, whittling a world of possibility down into two orderly little boxes. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life in two orderly little boxes. Hell, let alone like just the one damn box, which is one of the reasons I love rhetorical criticism, the close reading of texts that compose our collective common sense. Being a rhetorical critic is like having a superpower. You see as if there's only the two choices, either you're a feminist or you don't really believe in gender equality, and you turn that into just two possible ways of discovering options for creating a shared reality, which is why I'm using my 15 minutes of TEDx UGA fame to help all of you become better rhetorical critics. And there's no better place to start than with perhaps the most important I'm not a feminist but moment of recent memory Taylor Swift's 2015 music video for the hit single Bad Blood, a text so popular that it broke the Vivo record for most views in 24 hours, and so controversial that if you Google, for those of you that are old, that means look stuff up on the web, that if you do a Google search for Bad Blood and feminism, you return almost a million results that look like these. And I'll be the first to admit, when I first saw this video, I was not that taken. It's just rampantly conformist, hyper-consumerist, more than a little sexist, ableist, racist. <laughs> Certainly not a manifesto of women's equality. And while I love the rest of Swift's 1989 album and play it all the time, I skip over Bad Blood almost each time it comes on. It's this weird combination of a valley girl rant and a protest chant, and the verses sound like, hey, you, you did bad stuff. I'm really mad, so I'm going to sing about it. And then the chorus, <laughs> yeah, the chorus is way worse. And I'm going to need you to help me with this one. So if you know it, baby, now we've got bad blood. You know it used to be mad love. You something did it good. It did. <laughs> baby, now we've got bad blood. Hey. And it wasn't until last year when I got a chance to teach the politics of style, which is a course I teach here at UGA that I finally sat down and read Bad Blood closely like a rhetorical critic instead of a plus-size, cranky, mid-30s white lady. And thus, a TEDx talk was born. <laughs> so as we read together the 11 scenes of this epic bad girl montage mashup, try to resist those binary instincts and instead try taking the contradictions of Bad Blood for what they are, how most of us live our lives especially women, stuck between style and substance, and an invaluable opportunity to start pushing back against those orderly but agonizingly restrictive little boxes that run our lives and our politics. 
In scene one, we meet Catastrophe, played by Swift, a Lady bon James Bond type figure in mid caper, and her partner Arson, played by millennial pop artist Selena Gomez. In this scene, the combination of overly produced fight choreography and hyperbolic feminine tropes, such as booty bumping a chair into one's enemies while trading blows and stilettos, sends a pretty straightforward message that women are all style and no substance. Reviewers seem to agree. Describing Bad Blood as a Michael Bay trailer cut with mean girls, <laughs> buried in stylistic choices and post-production. And that's like two different reviewers, right? And these critiques sound awfully similar to things we often hear said about millennial feminism, or what Stylist Magazine has called feminism light, quote, all brand and no substance. But feminist light starts to get pretty interesting after Arson betrays catastrophe, kicking her viciously out a high-rise window, where she lands atop a conveniently parked Jaguar and strikes her, striking a classic damsel in distress pose. The pose is our first contradiction. On the one hand, the pose is passive, Scarlett O'Hara level woe is me victimization. But on the other hand, the pose is oddly active, it's resilient. It's a coy middle finger that declares a melodic vow for revenge. And as if that visually striking double bind of femininity weren't interesting enough, all of a sudden the words produced by Taylor Swift splash across the screen and they demand this secondary reading of woman as production, simultaneously the producer, maker and master of her own impressions and product, the passive victim of her own oppressions. Then Swift is whisked away to some underground rejuvenation chamber where her wounds heal quickly, but her emotional wounds, not so much. <laughs> Next, in scene four, we find Swift vigilantly marching through some kind of underground locker room for secret model agents, where she's clearly recruiting for something big. And Swift and her cohort glower at the camera, positioning us, the audience, as enemies, allies, and onlookers all at once. Then, having gathered together her revenge crew, Swift is positioned for the inevitable next phase of any decent payback plot, the training montage. Only this training montage has very little to do has very little to do with mastering combat. Rather, this is training in stylishness itself. These oversized glass human display cases in a random transparent car parked in the middle of nowhere suggest that these women are learning to be watched and be watchful. It's almost like a living museum exhibit that reads, come and see the 21st century woman's modes of resistance. It's training and production in being simultaneously producer and product. Then Swift gives us one long last steamy look before she begins her final phase of training in style. However, in contrast to the previous scenes, which were well lit with chick publicity, in the boxing ring, which is very dimly lit, these combatants only look at each other positioning us, the viewers, not so much as allies or spectators, but really creepy trespassers in some kind of underground women's fight club. <laughs> and while the previous scenes were individuating, the women were introduced one by one with clear facial shots and, and proper names, this scene is massifying. A group of unnamed women in homogenizing white tank tops gather around the room to watch the combatants. And it's tempting to want to read this particular scene as the final moment of real substance in the training montage, where there's finally some actual fighting that looks decent, and no longer focused on the what everyone's looking at, or what I'm wearing, or what you're doing, women can finally get down to the brass tacks of actual feminism. But before we give ourselves over to that reading, consider this. It's not an accident that at the very moment that the women, deprived of their proper name, and disposed to a space of traditionally masculine violence and domination, suddenly no longer read as feminism light. And if we give ourselves over to that reading, that binary impulse where action is one place and style is this other thing that we do, we're not only denying agency to millennial feminism in all of its contradictory forms, we're also denying centuries of oppressed people who were denied access to the space of action, like speech, politics, and the law 
and therefore had to use style and spectacle to speak truth to power. Finally, having completed her training montage, Swift and her crew, freshly styled, begin the inevitable march toward their final showdown with Arson and Company. As explosions rain down from nowhere, the length of the world's largest parking lot, and a gratuitous sprinkling of training flashbacks, delay and delay as we, the audience, wait and wait for the inevitable moment of vengeance. Except vengeance never comes. Instead, during the last three seconds, catastrophe and arson cross arms in violent syncopation as the last hey of the chorus rings out. And we're left leaving a little unsatisfied, except the cross is the final contradiction and the perfect way to end bad blood because it's not a real ending. The cross could mean so many things. It could mean that they actually went blow for blow in some kind of beautiful, sophisticated martial arts scene, or some really bitchy cat fight that would have just been embarrassing for everybody. Or maybe they went in for it and grabbed some hair and then they went, no, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> or maybe they got over it, shook hands, decided to collaborate, made peace, talked it out, like women are supposed to do. But the, the point is that by choosing none of these options, bad blood sort of leaves all of them on the table. And so in closing, I just want to ask, isn't that what you'd rather have for the next generation of feminists, to have it all on the table, rather than just a group of people who say what they mean? Thank you.